My name's Pete Wood. You're watching Hexham TV. Thank you very much for coming along this evening and welcome to Hexham TV. And we're very uh, pleased to have uh, with us again this evening um, the actor Stephen Tomlin. And Stephen is going to be um, reading um, a short story by H.G. Wells. Um, it should last about 30 minutes and it's called The Magic Shop. Stephen, uh, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Pete. And uh, why did you choose this story? Well, I just don't kind of like the quality of it. I, I realized because we've got three stories in the offer that I'm making. Uh, the last time we did uh, Oscar Wilde, The Canticle Ghost, which was a sort of inversion of a ghost story at the time and very playful and funny and romantic and and so on the back of I think we wrote it in the 1880s and this one is 1903 and the next one I'll be reading in December 1911 uh, an M.R. James story so in a way it's that late Victorian Edwardian and uh, style and they're three very different writers but all incredibly great craftsmen at their, and what they do and H.G. Wells when he wrote this he already had those novels I think we all heard about you know The Invisible Man, War of the Worlds uh, and, and so on only science fiction books. And what I liked about this story was that he's kind of distilled a lot of the elements of the science fiction, or as he called it, science romances, into this short story. And it's not really a frightening story, but it's a kind of slightly mildly disturbing, kind of supernatural, gentle story, really. Um, but I like the fact that he could get something of the novel into the short story. Uh, and it's an affectionate thing as well. It's interesting because the characters, um, a man with his son going to a toy shop in London and meeting a rather unusual guy who runs the shop and the amazing, extraordinary things that are in it and how that sort of turns his world upside down. But the boy is totally absor absorbed in the whole thing of the magic. So in a way, it's like a commentary about our childhood selves, you know, how mm -hmm. absorbed we get in something. And I think we all remember that. And when we get grown up, of course, that all goes away and we're full of the worries and concerns of the world and being a parent. So he captures that rather beautifully. And uh, also, you know, what is magic? And that thing of illusion and reality. And the way he plays with that, it's so attractive. And I thought, what a lovely little story this is. And apparently it had been made into a film. I think Alfred Hitchcock did it in one of his, uh, you know, An Evening with Alfred Hitchcock back in the 1950s. But it's also, you know, influential. I think about somebody going into a shop and, and it's not quite what it appears. Well, I think you can see that later on, can you, in other writers who are so influential, Harry Potter, for instance, you know, and, and what Rowling brings to that. Um, and uh, but there would be other stuff as well. It made me think of Mr. Ben, who used to go into a shop and then change into different characters and come out the other side, that wonderful cartoon series by David McKee. So I think in lots of ways, you know, here's a man writing 120 years ago, and it all seems very fresh and modern in many ways. But, you know, it's it's part of his fertile uh, imagination uh, in which he takes us into another world in his own inimitable writing style. And I have to tell you now, it's not the easiest thing to read. But the, partly because it's not the easiest thing to read, I really relish the challenge. So I think it's, uh, you'll see tonight whether the proof of the pudding, how that goes. Well, I'll leave the stage, uh, Stephen, to you. And... Um... Please uh, delight us with um, H.G. Wells and uh, the magic shop. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you all. The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells. I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice. A shop window of alluring little objects. Magic balls, magic hens, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls the material of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But I'd never had thought of going in, until one day, almost without warning, Jip pulled me by my finger right up to the window, and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth. A modest size frontage in Regent Street between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of patent incubators. But there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus, 
around the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn, always over the way, and a little inaccessible it had been, with something of the mirage in its position. But here it was, now, indisputably, and the fat end of Jip's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. If I was rich, said Jip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, I'd buy myself that, and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery, and called, as so a neat card asserted, to buy one and astonish your friends. Anything, said Jip, will disappear under one of those cones. I've read about it in a book. And there, Dada, is the vanishing hate me. Only they put it this way up, so we can't see how it's done. Jip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding, and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way. Only, you know, quite unconsciously, he lugged my finger doorward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jessie, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Jibbles, I said, and laid my hand on the door handle. Jib made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing precedence Jip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burden of the conversation to me. It was a little narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so we were alone, and could glance about us. There was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter. A grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled its head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in various sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, one to draw you out, long and thin, one to swell your head and vanish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a draught horse. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was, behind the counter. A curious, sallow, dark man, with one ear larger than the other, and the chin like the toe cap of a boot. What can we have the pleasure, he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so, with a start, we were aware of him. I want, I said, to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. Oh, sleight of hand, he asked. Mechanical, domestic. Anything amusing, said I. Hmm, said the shopman, and scratched his head for a moment, as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. Something in this way, he said, and held it out. The reaction was unexpected. I had seen the trick done at entertainments endless times before, when it's part of the common stock of conjurers, but I had not expected it here. That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it? said the shopman. Jip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman. And there it was. How much will that be? I asked. We make no charge for glass balls, said the shopman politely. We get them. He picked one out of his elbow as he spoke. Free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Jip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman, who smiled. You may have those too, said the shopman, and, if you don't mind, one from my mouth. So, Jip counselled me mutely for a moment, 
and then in a profound silence put away the four balls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. Oh, we get all our smaller tricks in that way, the shot man remarked. I laughed in the manner of one who subscribes to a jest. Well, instead of going to the wholesale shop, I said, of course, it's cheaper. In a way, the shop man said, though we pay in the end, but not so heavily as people suppose. Our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, we get out of that hat. And you know, sir, if you'll excuse me saying it, there isn't a wholesale shop, not for genuine magic goods. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his cheek and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, with his finger on the word, and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. See, well, he seemed to be carrying out this joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. He turned to Jip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, are the right sort of boy. I was surprised at his knowing that, because in the interest of discipline, he kept it rather a secret even at home. But Jip received it in unflinching silence keeping a steadfast eye on him. It's only the right sort of boy gets through that door. And, as if by way of illumination, there came a rattling at the door, and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard. Yeah, I want to go in there, Dada. I want to go in there. Yeah. And then the accents of a downtrodden parent, urging consolations and propitations. It's locked, Edward. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shop man, always for that sort of child. And as he spoke, we had a glimpse of the other youngster. A little white face, pallid from sweet eating and over sapid food, and distorted by evil passions. A ruthless little egotist, pawing at the enchanted pane. It's no good, sir, said the shop man, as I moved with my natural helpfulness doorward. And presently, the spoiled child was carried off, howling. How did she manage that? I said, breathing a little more freely. Magic, said the shop man, with a careless wave of the hand. And behold, sparks of coloured fire flew out of his fingers and vanished into the shadows of the shop. You were saying, he said, addressing himself to Jip, before you came in, that you would like one of our buy one and astonish your friends boxes. Jip, after a gallant effort, said, Yes, it's in your pocket. And leaning over the counter, he really did have an extraordinary long body, this amazing person produced the article in the customary conjurer's manner. A paper, he said, and took a sheet out of the empty hat with the springs. A string, and behold, his mouth was a string box, from which he drew an unending thread which, when he had tied the parcel, he bit off, and it seemed to me, swallowed the ball of string. And then he lit a candle at the nose of one of the ventriloquist dummies, stuck one of his fingers, which had become sealing wax red, into the flame, and so sealed the parcel. Then there was the disappearing egg, he remarked, and produced one from within my coat breast pocket, and packed it, and also the crying baby, very human. I handed each parcel to Jip as it was ready, and he clasped them to his chest. He said very little, but his eyes were eloquent. The clutch of his arms was eloquent. He was the playground of unspeakable emotions. These, you know, were real magics. Then, at the start, I discovered something moving about in my hat, something soft and jumpy. I whipped it off, and a ruffled pigeon, no doubt a confederate, dropped out and ran onto the counter, and went, I fancy, into a cardboard box behind the paper mache tiger. Ah, tut, tut, said the shop man, dexterously relieving me of my headdress. Careless bird, and, as I live, nesting. He shook my hat, and shook out into his extended hand two or three eggs, a large marble, a watch, about half a dozen of the inevitable glass balls, and then 
crumpled, crinkled paper. More and more and more, talking all the time of the way in which people neglect to brush their hats inside as well as out. Politely, of course, but with a certain personal application. All sorts of things accumulate, sir. Well, not you, of course, in particular, but nearly every customer. Astonishing what they carry about with them. The crumpled paper rose and billowed on the counter more and more and more until he was nearly hidden from us, until he was altogether hidden, and still his voice went on. We none of us know what the fair semblance of a human being may conceal, sir. Are we all then no better than brushed exteriors, whited sepulchres? His voice stopped. Exactly like when you hit a neighbour's gramophone with a well-aimed brick. The same instant silence, and the rustle of the paper stopped, and everything was still. Have you done with my hat? I said, after an interval. There was no answer. I stared at Jip, and Jip stared at me. And there were our distortions, in the magic mirrors, looking very rum and grave. And quiet. I think we'll go now, I said. Will you tell me how much all this comes to? I say, I said, on a rather louder note, I want the bill and my hat, please. There might have been a sniff from behind the paper pile. Let's look behind the counter, Jib, I said. He's making fun of us. I led Jib round the head wagging tiger. What do you think there was behind the counter? No one at all. Only my hat on the floor, and a common conjurer's lop-eared white rabbit lost in meditation, and looking as stupid and crumpled as only a conjurer's rabbit can be. I resumed my hat, and the rabbit lolloped a lollop or so out of the way. Dada, said Jip in a guilty whisper. What is it, Jip? said I. I do like this shop, Dada. So should I, I said to myself, if the counter wouldn't suddenly extend itself to shut one off from the door. But I didn't call Jip's attention to that. Pussy, he said, with a hand out to the rabbit as it came lolloping past us. Pussy, do Jip a magic. And his eyes followed it as it squeezed through a door I'd certainly not remarked a moment before. Then this door opened wider, and the man with one ear larger than the other appeared again. He was smiling still, but his eye met mine with something between amusement and defiance. You'd like to see our showroom, sir, he said, with an innocent suavity. The jip tugged my finger forward. I glanced at the counter and met the shopman's eye again. I was beginning to think... The magic was a little too genuine. Well, we haven't very much time, I said. But somehow we were inside the showroom before I could finish that. All goods of the same quality, said the shopman, rubbing his flexible hands together. And that is the best. Nothing in the place that isn't genuine magic and warranted thoroughly rum. Oh, excuse me, sir. I felt him pull at something that clung to my coat sleeve. And then I saw that he held a little wriggling red demon by the tail. The little creature bit and fought and tried to get at his hand. And in the moment he tossed it carelessly behind the counter. Oh, no doubt the thing was only an image of twisted India rubber, but for the moment... I... And his gesture was exactly that of a man who handles some petty, biting bit of vermin. I glanced at Jip, but Jip was looking at a magic rocking horse. I was glad he hadn't seen the thing. I say, I said in an undertone, and indicating Jip and the Red Demon with my eyes, you haven't many things like that about, have you? None of ours. Probably brought you with you, said the shop man, also in an undertone, and with a more dazzling smile than ever. Astonishing what people will carry about them on unawares. And then to Jip, do you see anything you fancy here? There were many things that Jip fancied there. He turned to this astonishing tradesman with mingled confidence and respect. Is that a magic sword? he said. Yeah, 
a magic toy sword. It neither bends, breaks, nor cuts the fingers. It renders the bearer invincible in battle against anyone under, under the age of 18. Half a crown to seven and sixpence, according to size. Now, these panoplies on cards are for juvenile knights errants and very useful. Shield of safety, sandals of swiftness, helmet of invisibility. Oh, daddy, gasped Jim. I tried to find out exactly what they cost, but the shopman did not heed me. Ah, we'd got Jim now. We'd got him away from my finger. He had embarked upon the exposition of all his confounded stock, and nothing was going to stop him. Presently, I saw, with a qualm of distrust and something very like jealousy, that Jip had hold of this person's finger, as usually he had hold of mine. Well, no doubt the fellow was interesting, I thought, and he had an interestingly fake lot of stuff. I mean, really good stuff. But still, I wandered after them saying very little, but keeping an eye on this presty digital fellow. After all, though, Jip was enjoying it, and no doubt when the time came to go, we should be able to go quite easily. It was a long, rambling place, that showroom, a gallery, broken up by stands and stalls and pillars, with archways leading off to other departments, in which the queerest-looking assistants loafed and stared at one, and with perplexing mirrors and curtains. Well, so perplexing, indeed, were these that I was presently unable to make out the door by which we had come. The shopman showed Jip magic trains that ran without steam or clockwork, just as you set the signals, and then some very, very valuable boxes of soldiers that all came alive directly you took off the lid and said, I myself haven't a very quick ear, and it was a tongue-twisting sound, but Jip, oh, he has his mother's ear, got it in no time. Bravo, said the shopman, putting the men back into the box unceremoniously and handing it to Jip. Now, said the shopman, and in a moment, Jip had made them all alive again. You'll take that box, said the shopman. We'll take that box, said I unless you charge its full value, in which case we need a trust magnate. Dear heart, no! And the shopman swept the little men back again, shut the lid, waved the box in the air, and there it was. Brown paper, tied up, and with Jip's name and address on the label. The shopman laughed at my amazement. This is the genuine magic, he said, the real thing. It's a little too genuine for my taste, I said again. After that, he fell to showing Jip tricks, or well, odd tricks, and still odder the way they were done. He explained them. He turned them inside out. And there was a dear little chap, nodding his busy bit of a head in the sagest manner. I did not attend as well as I might. Hey, presto, said the magic shop man. And then would come the clear, small, hey presto, of the boy. But I was distracted by other things. It was being borne in upon me just how tremendously rum this place was. It was, so to speak, inundated with a sense of rumness. There was something a little rum about the fixtures even, about the ceiling, about the floor, about the casually distributed chairs. And I had a queer feeling that whenever I wasn't looking at them straight, they went askew, askew, and moved about, and played a noiseless puss in the corner behind my back. And the cornice had a serpentine design with masks, masks altogether too expressive for proper plaster. Then, abruptly, my attention was caught by one of the odd-looking assistants. It was some way off, and evidently unaware of my presence. I saw a a three-quarter view of him over a pile of toys and through an arch, and he was leaning against a pillar in an idle sort of way, doing the most horrid things with his features. The particular horrid thing he did was with his nose. He did it just as though he was idle and wanted to amuse himself. First of all, 
It was a short, blobby nose. And then suddenly he shot it out like a telescope. And then out it flew and became thinner and thinner till it was like a long, red, flexible whip. Oh, like a thing in a nightmare it was. He flourished it about and flung it forth as a fly fisher flings his line. My instant thought was that Jip mustn't see this. I turned about and there was Jip, quite preoccupied with the shop man and thinking no evil. They were whispering together and looking at me. Jip was standing on a little stool and the shop man was holding a sort of big drum in his hand. I didn't see Dada, cried Jip. You're he. And before I could do anything to prevent it, the shopman had clapped the big drum over him. I saw what was up directly. Take that off, I cried. This instant, you'll frighten the boy. Take it off. The shopman with the unequal light ears did so without a word and held the big cylinder towards me to show its emptiness. And the little stool was vacant. In that instant, my boy had utterly disappeared. You know, perhaps, that sinister something that comes like a hand out of the unseen and grips your heart about. You know how it takes your common self away and leaves you tense and deliberate, neither slow nor hasty, neither angry or afraid. Well, so it was with me. I came up to this grinning shopman and kicked his stool aside. Now stop this folly, I said. Where is my boy? You see, he said still displaying the drum's interior. There is no deception. I put my hand out to grip him, and he eluded me by dexterous movement. I snatched again, and he turned from me and pushed open a door to escape. Stop, I said, and he laughed, receding. I leapt after him into utter darkness. Frod, oh Lord bless my heart, I didn't see you coming, sir. I was in Regent Street and I had collided with a decent-looking working man. Oh, and a yard away, perhaps, and looking a little perplexed with himself, stood Jip. There was some sort of apology, and then Jip had turned and come to me with a bright little smile, as though for a moment he had missed me. And he was carrying four parcels in his arm. He secured immediate possession of my finger. And for the second, I was rather at a loss. I stared round to see the door of the magic shop, and behold, it was not there. There was no door, no shop, nothing. Only the common pilaster between the shop where they sell pictures and the window with the chicks. I did the only thing possible in that, in that state of mental tumult. I walked straight to the curbstone and held up my umbrella for a cab. Ansoms, said Jip, in a note of culminating exultation. I helped him in, recalled my address with an effort, and got in also. Something unusual proclaimed itself in my tailcoat pocket, and I felt and discovered a glass ball. With a petulant expression, I threw it into the street. Jip said nothing. For a space, neither of us spoke. Dada, said Jip at last, that was a proper shop. I came round with that to the problem of just how the whole thing had seemed to him. Well, he looked completely undamaged, but so far, so good. He was neither scared nor unhinged. He was simply tremendously satisfied with the afternoon's entertainment, and there, in his arms, were the four parcels. Confound it. What could be in them? Hmm, I said. Little boys can't go to shops like that every day. He received this with his usual stoicism. For a moment, I was sorry I was his father and not his mother, and so couldn't suddenly there, Coram Publico, in and the handsome, kiss him. After all, I thought, really, the thing wasn't so very bad. But it was only when we opened the parcels that I really began to be reassured. Three of them contained boxes of soldiers, quite ordinary lead soldiers, but of so good a quality as to make Jip altogether forget that originally these parcels had been magic tricks of the only genuine sort. 
and the fourth, well, that contained a kitten, a little living white kitten, in excellent health and appetite and temper. I saw this unpacking with a sort of provisional relief. I hung about in the nursery for quite an unconscionable time. Ah, that happened six months ago. And now I'm beginning to believe it's all right. The kitten had only been magic, natural to all kittens, and the soldiers seemed as steady a company as any colonel could desire. And Jip? The intelligent parent will understand that I have to go cautiously with Jip. But I went so far as this one day. I said, how would you like your soldiers to come alive, Jip, and march about all by themselves? What well, mine do, said Jip. I just have to say a word I know before I open the lid. Then they march about alone? Oh, quite, Dada. I shouldn't like them if they didn't do that. I displayed no unbecoming surprise, and since I had taken occasion to drop in upon him once or twice unannounced when the soldiers were about, well, so far I have never discovered them, discovered them performing in anything like a magical manner. It's so difficult to tell. There's also the matter of finance. I have an incurable habit of paying bills. I've been up and down Regent Street several times, looking for that shop. I'm inclined to think, indeed, that in that matter, honour is satisfied, and that, since Jip's name and address is known to them, I may very well leave it to these people, whoever they may be, to send in their bill in their own time. Yeah. Very nicely read, Stephen. Thank you very much. And for the, those of you that may have come in late, um, that was Stephen Tomlin reading The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells. And uh, this is the second such reading that we've had on Hexam TV, live reading. And um, we're going to be doing more of these. And um, Stephen's uh, got the next one planned. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that one, Stephen? Yeah, it's from the great master storyteller, synonymous with ghost stories. I, I think people remember the story, uh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, M.R. James. But he wrote lots of ghost stories, a Cambridge academic, and uh, he wrote from the 1890s. He originally wrote them to entertain friends at Christmas. And that tradition has continued, not just in his lifetime, but long after it. His ghost stories have never been out of print. And uh, the one I've chosen is, is the Tractate Midoth. Uh, interesting mouthful of a title, um, but it's uh, it's a great story. It's full of adventure and even got a, a touch of romance as well. So it kind of links with this one and the first one that we did. And um, it's a lovely story. Um, and again, it'll be about 30, 35 minutes. And as you know, Pete, we've talked about a date and we're thinking around the 17th of December could be a provisional date for doing, the, doing this one. But obviously we'll advertise it and hopefully it'll just get people in that bit of spirit with Christmas coming, uh, of reading, of hearing a traditional, well-made, well-crafted, lovely, sort of little spine tingler of a ghost story. Well, thanks again, Stephen, and uh, thank you everyone who's been watching this evening. Yes, very much so, I'd echo that. And um, we really appreciate um, you taking part, and uh, we hope you enjoyed um, the story that Stephen read. And do follow Hexham TV on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Instagram. And uh, keep up to date with uh, other events that will be going live on Hexham TV. Thank you very much, and uh, have a very good evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye now.